Hi everyone, I continue working on Cybertruck. In the previous episodes, I stopped at installing an M57 electric motor in a homemade Cybertruck. It was a real challenge, and I didn't succeed in starting it normally. Nevertheless, I still made the first test drive on Cybertruck and noticed for myself what things need to be fixed and redone. As the electronics was designed for the EM61 motor, I decided to change the EM57 for EM61 and order it from the salad chart. While waiting for it, we need to fix things in the Cybertruck design. First thing to fix is the steering. It was made in haste to test the installed electric motor. In addition, the steering rack only fits in this place under the gear unit, which is a serious mistake. Due to this disposition, the wheels of the Cybertruck will turn incorrectly and the vehicle control will be hampered. We need to come up with something and move the steering rack forward. There is a place right for it. I completely forgot that Cybertruck doesn't have any struts and the entire weight of the wheel falls on the air below. While there are no shock struts, I tied the suspension arms to the frame and continued my work. By the way, the suspension travel can be left at this level. In the real version of Cybertruck, the wheel hub is flush with the rocker panel. To remove the steering rack forward, we need to interchange the knuckles. After removing the steering knuckles, the pivot rods will be placed in front. They'll need to be finalized, but more about that later. This steering rack is no longer suitable, as the rotation of the rear and front steering rack is different. The rotation of the rear steering shaft differs from the movement of the steering links. However, the front steering rack rotation coincides with the steering wheel movement. There is enough space for the mechanism. I'm going to place the steering rack between the gear unit and the gearbox. The knuckles were interchanged and bolted to the suspension arms. Now we need to change the position of the plane arms so that they match the front position. According to this scheme, the ball joint of the tie rod should stay in this line. To prevent the suspension arm from sag at the wheel disc, the hole should be enlarged to approximately 7 mm. I'll have to shorten it a bit. I used thick welding to make it easier to bend. I welded the bracket to the frame and fastened the steering rack to it. The scheme will be the same as before. I'll use a crossbar with track rods. That's not the final version. Eventually, I need to find the normal steering rack. I set the crossbar relative to the steering rack and welded the mounting bracket. The configuration turned out to be quite dense. The steering shaft will be passed through the suspension arm. Now the bracket needs to be reinforced. For this purpose, from the other side, I welded another slab to fit the dust cover. I guess initially such a rail will be quite enough. After the first test drive, I noticed that it was a little inconvenient to press the pedals. Since the steering rack has been moved, nothing prevents us from moving the pedals for 10-15 cm forward. The pedals are in place, and now it's much more convenient to press them. Further go the struts. We need to finally install them before I break the pneumatic cylinders. I found the most suitable place for the front struts. We need to make a mount for them and weld it to the frame. I 
I stopped at this variant of suspension travel. If necessary, the wheel can be lowered by another 10 cm due to the remaining margin. Before I had time to install all the struts, the electric motor EM61 got delivered. I dropped everything to focus on connecting it to the control units. It's slightly different from the electric motor EM57. The first thing that catches the eye is the cooling outputs located in different places. They have the same shaft with splines, which means you can try to get by with a little blood and change the electric motor. The only thing that matters is that at least a couple of fastening holes should fit the gear unit from EM57. Now we need to check it, install the wires on it and try to run it. For this purpose, I resoldered the resolver wires back in colors. I changed them in order to start EM57 in the opposite direction. I connected phase conductors quickly and connected the battery. I'll start with 100 volts so far. The engine started, but again, like the previous time, it faulted. As if nothing has changed, I ran EM57 with blocks from EM61. I decided to find out at what speed the motor falls. I made a comparison. If the inverter falls, that means that at certain values of the variable resistor, the electronics cannot maintain certain revolutions due to lack of voltage and gives an error. I added cells to the battery and already received 140 volts of constant voltage. It feels like the motor spun faster. We need to know how many revolutions the shaft produces. 1000 more and there goes an arrow. It turns out that if I add 5 more cells, the electric motor will reach 4000 revolutions. I decided to give it a try. It feels like the shaft has spun much more than 4000 revolutions. Five thousand, and the electronics don't fall. That's getting interesting, but also dangerous at the same time. We need to fix the engine, as it can produce 11,000 revolutions, and if the shaft stops abruptly at the moment, then I'm afraid I won't be able to find it. In fact, it was scary to spin it up to 11,000 revolutions for the first time. At the same time, the thin phase wires get very bad. The heating occurs instantly. But this is already a success. As I understand it, the limitation was overcome and the engine can produce all 11,000 revolutions, although they are not needed since the efficiency lowers greatly at such revolutions. Now we need to reduce the voltage and examine at what values the electronics won't get an error. I started at 148 volts. The protection turns on. I added one more cell and received 156 volts. With such a voltage, the electric motor will be able to produce its maximum values. I slightly got used to the stretch of the engine and tried to spin it to a maximum. After 11,000, another shutdown is triggered and the revolution sharply lower till 8,000. This is good, since it's not clear what centrifugal force can cause over 11,000 revolutions. I also decided to try using the maximum number of cells I have. Still, the electronics don't allow sharply spinning the motor shaft in idle. The motor, the drive gearbox and the wheels are inextricably linked, so this method won't work in practice. I don't know if it's possible to measure the current on the phase conductors in this way, but the device showed nothing. Still, the peak value on the battery wires was around 100 amps. It was shown at maximum values when the efficiency is minimal. Now it's clear why electric cars discharge faster at high speeds. The electric motor simply doesn't work effectively in such modes. There will be 24 cells in the assembly. I want to divide them into 4 blocks with 6 cells. It'll be easier to balance and charge the battery. Now I want to test EM57, which is already installed. Maybe get lucky and it'll work at a high voltage and won't fault. For this purpose I connected the phase conductors again and resoldered the resolver. 
I turned on the power, but the engine didn't start. It feels like something is jammed because according to the conductors, there is power on the wires. It appears that there was a surprise. It was as if the gear broke and the shaft began to run idle. This was very strange as the Cybertruck drove into the workshop on its own and everything worked properly. I began to search for a problem. I started with the engine gearbox. Everything seems to spin. It was a suspicion by splines of the drive shaft since it was from another car, but it was also fine. There is clearly something wrong with the gearbox, as if the bearing had crumbled and the teeth were missing each other. We need to take off the engine and check everything without it. After removing the engine, I saw that the drive spins calmly, there are no backlashes and accordingly no crackling. We need to open the gear unit and see what happened to it. I immediately tried it on the engine and realized that it absolutely doesn't align with the hose. Only the shaft is suitable. After disassembly, it turned out that all teeth were in place, as well as the bearings. This detail also couldn't stop the shaft, since it's spring-loaded in the opposite direction. It seems to me that the engine started emitting crackling at high voltage, as it spun regularly at 80 volts, but an error occurred after 2000 revolutions. It's okay, it just didn't work out. Then we need to combine the gear unit from EM57 with the motor EM61. It's possible to make it, but we'll have to completely reweld the lever's fasteners and sew the case, as it abuts on the motor. It's easier to buy a native gear unit from EM61. I found such a unit on the internet. The price matched the condition. It buzzes and we need to change the bearings in it. The gears are in good condition, but the bearings are quite noisy. There is also a slight difference in shafts and bearings in the differential. I took a set of new bearings, it's time to change them. I have no special adapters, still it wasn't possible to pull off the bearings with a puller. The only way is to thrust them with stock cuts and chisels. I removed all bearings and pressed in the new ones. The same was done with all the shafts. I want to keep the parking in order not to make a hydraulic handbrake later. Now we need to assemble everything and check how it works. While testing, I had a thought. Since I have almost two sets of electrical installations, what if to remove the gearbox and install an electric motor on both the front and the rear axle? I weighed the pros and cons. Because of high decrease in turns due to the gear unit combined with the manual gearbox, the Cybertruck will have a large turning moment, still it will be able to accelerate to 50 km per hour at 11,000 revolutions with an electric motor. At the same time, the power efficiency will be very low. The drive shaft will also be removed, which is essentially placed in the cabin, and it should be redone and balanced. Two electric motors as well are much better than one. Of course, somehow we'll have to manage to cram the electric motor with the gear unit between the suspension arms. Most likely, we'll have to reweld the subframe and change the length of the upper arms. I think it's worth it. And after installation of one electric motor on the front axle, the Cybertruck will already be able to ride, and all that remains is to buy control board and batteries for the rear electric motor and also install an electric unit on the rear axle. 
most likely that'll be easier. In the upcoming parts I will begin installing the first electric motor on the front axle. In the meantime, thanks all of you for your attention. If you liked it, put your thumb up. See you in the next part.